Hi everyone, today, I'm excited to show you how to design a microstrip patch antenna at the point for gigahertz using CST Studio Suite, a powerful electromagnetic simulation software. Before we dive into the design process, let's take a moment to understand what a microstrip patch antenna is and why it's an important component in RF and microwave engineering. A microstrip patch antenna is a type of antenna with a low profile, which can be mounted on a printed circuit board. These antennas consist of a conducting patch on one side of a dielectric substrate, with a continuous ground plane on the other side. Microstrip patch antennas are widely used in applications such as Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, satellite communications, RFID systems, and wearable technology. Patch antennas have many features such as compact size, planar structure, low profile, and ease of integration. The operation of a microstrip patch antenna is primarily based on the principles of resonance and radiation. Here's a detailed explanation of each. 1. Resonance. The patch antenna resonates at a specific frequency, which is determined by the dimensions of the patch and the properties of the substrate. The patch acts like a resonant cavity where standing waves are formed. The frequency at which the antenna efficiently radiates is called the resonant frequency. It can be approximated using the following formulas. 2. Radiation. When an alternating current is supplied to the patch typically via a feed line, it excites the resonant modes of the patch. At resonance, the patch supports a standing wave pattern of the electric and magnetic fields, which leads to radiation. The polarization of the microstrip patch antenna linear or circular is determined by the shape and feeding method of the patch. Most common designs are linearly polarized. There are many different types of feeding for a rectangular patch antenna. A microstrip feed line is connected directly to the edge of the patch like figure A. This feeding is simple to design and fabricate. In the coaxial probe feed a coaxial cable is connected to the patch through the substrate like figure B. This kind of feeding could provide good impedance matching and minimal spurious radiation. In aperture coupled feed, a slot is used in the ground plane to couple energy to the patch-like figure C. This technique isolates feed and patch and reduces spurious radiation. In the proximity coupled feed, a microstrip line under the patch is coupled through electromagnetic fields. This feeding could provide good bandwidth and isolation. An overview of the tutorial can be found on this slide. We will start by designing a 2.4 GHz patch antenna fed by a microstrip line. Then, a 1 for array will be designed to show how we can change the amplitude and phase in the CST to steer the radiation beam. Finally, you'll see a design of a power divider 1 2 for ways that feeds the patch antenna array. Now, let's see some key design parameters that are crucial for designing the patch antenna. This patch antenna will be designed for 2.4 GHz operation on a dielectric Rogers RT5880 with 1.6 mm thickness. As you see in the picture, the length of patch was chosen to be the same as its width to obtain a symmetric radiation pattern. Understanding these parameters is crucial for designing a microstrip patch antenna. With this knowledge in mind, let's move on to the practical part of our tutorial where we'll use CST Studio Suite to design and simulate our own antenna. Stay tuned. Begin by opening CST Studio Suite and creating a new project. Select Microwave and RF, Optical from the template options. Select Antennas, choose Planar. Now choose Frequency Domain Solver for this analysis. Click on Next. Click on Next. Set the frequency range from 1.5 GHz to 3.5 GHz to cover our frequency of interest. After that, press Next. Press Finish to create the project. In the first step, we'll add the structural parameters into Parameter List section.
Now, we would like to define a dielectric substrate. Go to Modeling and select Brick, then press ESC to show the dialog box. Create a dielectric substrate with the parameters defined. We'll use Rogers RT5880 with a dielectric constant of 2.2. In the load from material library search to find Rogers RT5880 lossy. Now, in the same process, define a ground plane for the created substrate. Let's set the PC thickness to 17 microns. With the dielectric and ground plane parameters set, we'll move on to designing the layout of the patch antenna. Through modeling and brick, draw a patch. In this step, the input impedance of the patch at the edge should be determined by placing a length of 50 ohms transmission line at the edge. To do that, through modeling and brick, draw a length of 50 ohms transmission line at the edge of patch. And, by pressing the S key on your keyboard, select the end surface of the transmission line. Next, click on Simulation in the top menu, from there, select Waveguide Port. A waveguide port should cover a space around the end of the transmission line. As a result, we need to specify these margins in the waveguide port setting. We apply a margin of 5 times HS to the right, left, and top sides of the waveguide ports. Moreover, the waveguide port covers the edge of the dielectric. To cover the bottom edge of the dielectric, we consider a margin of HS. It is now necessary to adjust the distance from the reference plane to touch the edge of the transmission line.
Currently, everything appears to be complete for calculating patch impedance. To set up the solver, go to Simulation and click Setup Solver. Run the simulation by clicking Start. Once the simulation has been completed, locate the S parameters folder under the navigation tree. There is no matching, as can be seen. You can find the edge input impedance of patch by looking at the real and imaginary parts of the input Z parameter in the Z matrix folder. By embedding the 50 ohms transmission line, the edge input impedance was determined to be 343 ohms. We will use a quarter wavelength transformer to match the 343 ohms input impedance to a 50 ohms line. For this reason, the feeding network was equipped with a transformer with a quarter wavelength. In order to accomplish this, we begin by drawing the feeding network in accordance with the design parameters. We begin by changing the dimensions of the 50 ohms transmission line. Create a quarter wave transformer using modeling and brickwork.
Open the Waveguide port settings by double-clicking on it. Set the distance to the reference plane to zero. We should define some frequency specifications before beginning the simulation so that we can see radiation patterns at far field. You should go to the field monitor, then activate the far field RCS button and define another setting as I have done. The simulation can now be started by going to the setup solver and press the start. Upon completion of the simulation, click on the S parameters folder to view the antenna return loss. Choose the frequency point of to point for gigahertz in the far field folder in order to view far field radiation patterns. The 3D radiation pattern at to point for gigahertz is now visible. As this antenna has a linear polarization, select the linear directional button in the settings. Using the far field plot menu, we can see all details regarding the radiation pattern, including directivity, IEEE gain, realized gain, power flow, copolar, crosspolar, and axial ratio for different cutting angles. Additionally, 1D plots of radiation patterns can be viewed here. In the Cartesian plot, if you wish to view the radiation beam in the range of minus 180 degrees to plus 180 degrees, you should select the far field properties and then activate these options.
We will proceed to the second step of this tutorial in which we will design a one-time for array of patch antennas. For this purpose, we need to define for elements of the single element patch in a specific space in the X direction like this picture. In order to do this, right-click and select Rectangle Selection from the menu. Then, select all components of the single element patch antenna. Next, click on the Transform button. To make a copy of selected components, the Translate option must be selected and a blank square must be clicked to the left of the Copy button. In the space blank in front of X, define parameter as for this parameter, we consider 60 to 0.5 mm, which is equal to half wavelength in free space at 0.4 GHz. With the selection of 3 as the repeating number, selected components have been copied 3 times along the x-axis with a space of 60 to 0.5 mm in between each copy. By selecting ground planes in the components and pressing Shift and Plus on the keyboard, the selected components will be united. Now select the dielectric components, go to Boolean, and click the Add button. Select dielectric components will also be united. Using the M key on the keyboard, select the center of the two patch edges. There is a distance of 60 to 0.5 millimeters between the center and center of the antennas. Go to simulation and press the start button.
Once the simulation process has been completed, open the S parameters folder. Listed below are the scattering parameters for for antenna elements. During this section, we will examine how the beam direction is steered by changing the output phase of antenna elements. Go to the post processing menu and select the combine results option. You can define the amplitude and phase shift of each antenna element in the table that appears. As a first sample, we choose a uniform excitation with the same amplitude and phase for each element. After that, click on Combine. Once the processing has been completed, a new result will appear for each frequency point in the Farfield folder. In these results, we can see the far field data at each specified point with the uniform excitation applied. By uniformly excitation of antenna elements, a fan beam radiation pattern was observed. In accordance with phased array theory, since the distance between the center and the center of each close patch element is half wavelength, and each antenna is excited by the same amplitude and phase, the theoretical value of side lobe level should be about minus 13.6 decibels. We have a side lobe level of minus 13.6 decibels. In this step, we want to excite each antenna with the same amplitude, but with different phases. In order to accomplish this, go to the post processing menu and select the combine results option. We choose the same amplitude and 30 degrees of phase difference between the output ports of the antenna elements for the first sample. Upon selecting the amplitude and phase values, a distinct label is displayed in this section. On this label, the amplitude and phase values are displayed for each input port. Then, click on Combine. For each frequency point in the Farfield folder, a new result with a distinct label will be displayed after processing. Let us now define another type of excitation that has the same amplitude a different phase as the previous type. The same amplitudes are chosen for this sample, but with a 45 degree phase difference. Now click on Combine to start the process. Let us now define in another type of combined excitation. The same amplitudes are chosen for this sample, but with a 60 degree phase difference. Now click on Combine to start the process for this sample. As soon as you have processed the samples, close the combined results window and go to the Farfield folder to see the results at 2.4 GHz. In the created icons, each sample of excitation has a distinct label that indicates the amount of amplitude and phase for the input signal. Choose the first sample. The amplitude of signals in this sample was the same and the phase difference between inputs was 30 degrees. To view the beam steering angle, open 1D and select the Cartesian plot. 
It can be seen here that the main beam direction is at an angle of 9 degrees. As an aid to understanding how the beam steers to this angle, I have provided some equations of phased array theory. Given the parameters of this phased array with four patch antenna elements working at 2.4 GHz, arranged along the x-axis, and separated by 60 to 0.5 mm, we can calculate the beam steering angle when these elements are excited with a phase difference of 30 degrees. The main beam of the phased array with four patch antenna elements based 60 to 0.5 mm apart and excited with the same amplitude but a 30 degree phase difference is steered to an angle of approximately minus 9.59 degrees from the broadside direction. Let us now examine the results of another type of excavation with a 45 phase difference and the same amplitude. It can be seen here that the main beam direction is at an angle of minus 14 degrees. Given the parameters of this array with four patch antenna elements working at 2.4 GHz, arranged along the x-axis, and separated by 60 to 0.5 mm, we can calculate the beam steering angle when these elements are excited with a phase difference of 45 degrees. The main beam of the phased array excited with the same amplitude but a 45 degree phase difference is steered to an angle of approximately minus 14.48 degrees from the broadside direction. Let us now examine the results of another type of excavation with a 60 degrees phase difference and the same amplitude. Given the parameters of this array with four patch antenna elements working at 2.4 GHz, arranged along the x-axis, and separated by 60 to 0.5 mm, we can calculate the beam steering angle when these elements are excited with a phase difference of 60 degrees. The main beam of the phased array excited with the same amplitude but a 60 degree phase difference is steered to an angle of approximately minus 19.47 degrees from the broadside direction. Clicking on the 3D option allows us to see the steered beam for different kinds of defined exceations. As we move forward, we want to see how the beam direction moves in a reverse direction. This can be achieved by defining non-progressive phases for the same excitation modes as before. Click on Combine Results and Define Excitation as shown here. As soon as you have processed the samples, close the combined results window and go to the Farfield folder to see the results at 2.4 GHz. As can be seen here, the main beam is streaming along x-axis with the change in excitation.
This section involves designing a 1 to 4 way micro strip power divider using CST Studio Suite. Presented here is a schematic overview of this power divider and its structural parameters. In this structure, there is an input port and for output ports. This structure divides electromagnetic power equally between output ports as electromagnetic power enters the input port. Ideally, each output port should receive an electromagnetic signal of minus 6 decibels. Let's starting the simulation. Select microwave and RF, optical from the template options. Select circuits and components, fuse planar couplers and dividers. Now choose frequency domain solver for this analysis. Click on next. In this section, set the frequency range from 1.5 GHz to 3.5 GHz to cover our frequency of interest. After that, press next, press finish to create the project of design power divider. Now, we'll add the structural parameters into parameter list section. Through modeling and brick to find a dielectric substrate. We'll use Rogers RT5880 lossy with a dielectric constant of 2.2 in the load from material library search to find material.
Now, in the same process, define a ground plane for the created substrate. With the dielectric and ground plane parameters set, we'll move on to designing the layout of the power divider. As you see in this figure, this power divider has a symmetrical structure. So, we can design the half of layout with defined parameters, then mirror them to complete the layout. Click on brick in the modeling menu, click the ESC button on the keyboard to open the box. As shown in the last image, define the specified sections.
Mirror option can now be used to reflect solids 6 and 7. Solids should be reflected to this point. This can be accomplished by selecting solids 6 and 7 and then selecting transform tools. To make a copy of these lines, select the mirror option and click the blank square to the left of the copy button. By entering the specified point in the blank space in front of the selected lines, the selected lines will be reflected on the x-axis. At the center point of the coordinator system, other solids should be reflected relative to the x-axis. Click on solids, then click on the transform tool. Entering a 1 in the blank in front of x-axis will reflect the selected line on that axis. We need to create two arcs at the junction between solid 3 and solid 3 to 1 in this step. In order to do that, press S on your keyboard and select the solid 3 edge. Go to Blend option and select Blend Edge. Select R as the radius value, then click OK. The same procedure should be followed for solid 3 to 1. Almost all of the power dividers layout has been completed. Smoothing out the sharp corners between lines is all that's needed. It helps to improve impedance matching if these sharp corners are smoothed. By pressing S on the keyboard, select the sharp edge of the corner, and then choose Blend Edge from the Blend option. Put R as the value of radius, then press OK dot dot. Do the same process to smooth all the sharp corners. In the next step, begin defining the waveguide ports at both the input and output of the power divider. In the 1 to 4 way power divider, port 1 is the input port and ports 2, 3, 4, and 5 are the output ports.
in boundaries, choose the open ad space for all directions. Go to Setup Solver to start the run. There are some settings to be made here. Click on the source type and choose the selection option. Now, active port 1 in the excitation list. Go back to the source type and select port 1. The analysis will begin once you click on Start. Open the S parameters folder after the analysis is complete to see the scattering parameters. According to the results, this power divider covers a frequency range of 1.8 GHz to 3.1 GHz with a return loss of minus 15 decibels. In the whole operating bandwidth, the transmission coefficient is approximately minus 6 decibels. This tutorial will conclude with a connection made between the patch array and the power divider. This can be done in a simple manner. Select all waveguide output ports and then delete them all. Now open the CST file for the patch array. Make sure all solids are selected. Go to Home in the top menu and click Copy. Back at the Power Divider CST file, click the Paste button and press Enter. The antenna array configuration has just been moved here as a separate component. The new components can be found in a folder named Component 2 in the navigation tree. All antenna array configurations are selected when component 2 is selected. Select the transform under modeling. It is possible to move component 2 in any direction we choose. Changing the name of components is now possible. Since the antenna array is on component 2, we rename it antenna array. As component 1 contains a power divider, we change its name to power divider. In this step, we will connect the input ports of the antenna array to the output ports of the power divider. You can do this by pressing S on the keyboard to select one point of the output ports of the divider. Then find the corresponding point in the input port of the antenna and select that point by pressing the S key.
Now, select the antenna array components and go to the transform option. Antenna array inputs are automatically connected to power divider outputs. The far field frequency points should be defined before starting the simulation. Visit the field monitor. By activating the far field RCS button, you can define a frequency bandwidth with the desired step width. In the frequency range of 1.5 GHz to 3.5 GHz, I choose 0.05 as the step width. Press start after selecting all ports in the setup solver. Once the analysis is complete, go to the simulation results page. Upon opening the S parameters folder, it is expected that the antenna array based on the power divider will function on the 2.4 GHz frequency. Additionally, all the farfield data for this structure can be found in the farfield folder. Thank you for watching this tutorial on designing a patch antenna array using CST Studio Suite. We covered the basics of patch antennas, the design process, and analyzed the simulation results. I hope you found this video helpful and informative. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment below with your thoughts or questions, and don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more tutorials and technical content. Also, check out the description for additional resources and related videos. Stay tuned for our next video where we'll dive deeper into advanced antenna design techniques. Thanks again for watching, and see you in the next video.